What you people, who weren't yet born, can never know, is what it meant to sleep in cities under silent falls of snow, when all night long the only sounds you heard were dogs that barked at trains that passed so far away they took a shortcut through your dreams and no one even woke. It was the war that changed that. It was, after the great war for civilization, sleep was different everywhere. Timothy Finley. Coward. Guts and gators. Butcher. I am getting ready for another core battle to preserve sweet and clean the memory of Canada's final effort. Arthur Curry. When the firing stops, people begin to line up on different sides and begin to mark out their territory for history, for their nation, um, for their own reputation. Curry was not very good at that. Sir Arthur Curry became the leader of the Canadian Corps in 1917. They would never lose another battle. In the last hundred days of the Great War, those victories would come at a terrible cost. 45,000 men would die. William Preston cannot forget the cost. Curry, he feels, is to blame. The Ontario Reporter writes an article about the decade-old rumors. It was the last day, the last hour, and almost the last minute when the Commander-in-Chief conceived the mad idea that it would be a fine thing to say that the Canadians had fired the last shot in the Great War. Mr. Speaker, you cannot find one Canadian soldier returning from France who will not curse the name of the officer who ordered the attack on Mons, thus needlessly sacrificing the lives of Canadian soldiers. After the war, Sir Sam Hughes, Canada's former war minister, calls Sir Arthur Curry a butcher. Ten years later, the Port Hope Evening Guide prints Preston's accusations. Curry sues for defamation. When his friends ask him why, the answer, Curry says, is Sam Hughes. Hughes the type of person who'd walk into a room and begin shouting, and, and every, we thought everyone should listen to him. He really thought he was loved by everyone. In fact, most people found him just absolutely infuriating, and he, um, a, a boasting liar, and, um, and the soldiers caught on to that very quickly too. In 1916, Hughes is forced to resign. The man who turned a band of militias into a national fighting force has lost control. His political allies abandon him. Bitter and forced into obscurity, Sam Hughes looks for a fight. Sir Arthur Curry, after the war, is feted by the British Empire and receives all kinds of accolades, and he's quite justifiably proud in himself and his Canadian Corps. When Sam Hughes finally makes these charges, even knows that they're coming, he really can't get his head around this. He has no idea why would anyone listen to Sam Hughes. It's complete nonsense. And secondly, you know, I helped to win this war, the Great War for Civilization, as it was called. Why am I being blamed for it? Some Canadians prefer to spend their time in uttering most malicious and vicious lies about matters concerning which they know very, very little. I am surprised that the House of Commons sat and listened to Sam Hughes. He says I ordered the attack on Mons four hours before the armistice was to come into effect. I knew in the morning that Mons had been captured during the night. The casualties were very small indeed. Only one Canadian fell at Mons, but it was the last day, the last of a hundred horrible days for the Canadians. 
There are no easy victories on the Western Front, and they lose 45,000 men over a 100-day period. So horrendous casualties. The Canadian Corps was an elite fighting formation. They were the um, shock troops of the British Army. But on the home front, what did they see? They saw their brothers and their fathers and their uncles and their neighbors and the members of their church and the member of their choir being killed off and wounded in this terrible time. And this is what feeds Sam Hughes. Forty-five thousand men dead in one hundred days. Many Canadians agree with Hughes that Curry is to blame. So the rumors of Mons persisted for ten years. The charge is one that had been repeated for the last ten years, but this is the first time it has appeared in print. I feel that this lie had better be nailed now and not be allowed to go undisputed. Curry has a strong case. No one could prove Mons was a massacre, but that didn't stop the defense. Frank Reagan represents the paper. They felt that it had been buried and that Curry and his friends in high places had buried it. So this was a chance for them to bring the truth out. Curry takes the stand. With a quarter of a million casualties in your corps, weren't you satisfied they had done enough fighting? Absolutely satisfied. And I know a great deal more about the casualties, Mr. Reagan, than you do. I saw those magnificent battalions go to battle and come out badly decimated. I saw ambulance after ambulance full of wounded soldiers, shrieking, groaning, dying dead. I have feelings about it that you can never appreciate. Reagan was refighting the First World War, but he was fighting it 10 years later in a courtroom without any of the trials and stress. In four years, Curry barely left the front lines. While in command, he worked 18-hour days putting into action the orders he received from the British High Command. At every turn, Curry worked to save the lives of his men. I'm not clever enough to guess in this game. I have to set everything down and figure it out. It's harder work than being brilliant, but safer. Curry is not your traditional um, general in the First Whole War. His uniform never looked like it fit. It was always riding up on him. Um, the soldiers made fun of him, called him guts and gators. He didn't look like a, a general. The thing is, though, that he had the mind of a very fine general. Curry made sweeping changes to the Canadian strategy. The creeping barrage, small unit tactics, changes that impressed his superiors and ensured Canadian victories in the last hundred days. This is the war of the trenches, the war of enormous firepower, where the defensive lines, uh, protected by barbed wire, artillery, machine guns, uh, reinforcements, are always stronger than the offensive. But Curry was always learning, and I think that's his most defining characteristic. The trial is a brutal affair. Two weeks of constant attacks against Curry and his reputation. Reagan was going for the kill. He thought he had him set up. Wouldn't it have been better 
after having defeated 47 divisions, for you to have allowed these troops to remain west of Mons for a few hours. In which case, Mons would have been in your possession. Then Curry responds with this vigorous counterattack. No. You would have them disobey an order. You would have them mutiny. You would have them be guilty of treason and act in an unsoldierly way, right at the very last. Those were not the men who did that sort of thing. In that moment, Curry had won. It was a narrowly focused charge that said that Curry, in effect, had sent his men off to capture this city for his own glory. And when he marched into the city, his own soldiers almost turned on him and shot him. None of that was true. If the newspaper article had said, the casualties during the 100 days are horrendous, 45,000, and um, you know, there are some soldiers who blame Curry for this, well, they would have been right. Curry clears his name, but the trial has taken its toll. After seeing the old general, William Lyon Mackenzie King notes in his diary, looking at him, one would think him a man between 50 and 60, rather than 43. I cannot tell you how ashamed I am of myself in letting that cursed trial get on my nerves. But for 10 years, I had suffered from that malicious lie. And when I had a chance to fight my defamers, so many seemed to think that I should let the lie die. But I had to do it. I wanted the people of Canada to know the truth. I think um, for many veterans, it took after the war and at the trial, maybe, and even beyond that, to understand that they had a very fine general who was leading them, and despite the carnage, who ultimately tried to save their lives. Oddly enough, we didn't love him. I don't think we realized exactly how good a man we'd got. Private H.W. Johnson. When Curry hears that the defense will appeal, he suffers a stroke. He dies in 1933, and the trial dies with him. <laughs> 